Hey everyone. So today we've got Jim Butcher's book five. Always get that backwards. I want to go to my left to move it to the center of the screen when it's not in the center of the screen. But anyway, book five of the Dresden Files here. Jim Butcher's Death Masks. Today what we're on is chapter 15. So, please do choose to, if you haven't, check out the other books, 1 through 4 down below, and the other chapters of even this book, 1 through 15 down below. And give me a thumbs up, comment, like, subscribe, let me know more about what you think. And without further ado... I'm going to go ahead and start on chapter 15. I had bad dreams. They were the usual fare. Flames devoured someone who screamed my name. A pretty girl spread her arms, eyes closed, and fell slowly backwards as dozens of fine cuts opened all over her skin. The air became a fine pink spray. I turned from it, into a kiss with Susan, who drew me down and tore out my throat with her teeth. A woman, who seemed familiar, but whom I did not recognize, shook her head and drew her hand from left to right. The dream scenery faded to black in the wake of her motion. She turned to me, her dark eyes intent, and said, You need rest. Mickey Mouse woke me up, my alarm jangling noisily, his little hand on two and big hand on twelve. I wanted to smack the clock for waking me up, but I'd reined in the impulse. I'm not against a little creative violence now and then, but you have to draw the line somewhere. I wouldn't sleep in the same room with a person who would smack Mickey Mouse. I got up, got dressed, left a message for Murphy, another for Michael, fed Mr., and hit the road. Michael's house did not blend in with most of the other homes in his neighborhood, west of Wrigley Field. It had a white picket fence. It had elegant windows dressing. It had a tidy front lawn that was always green, even in the midst of a blazing Chicago summer. It had a few shady trees, a lot of well-kept shrubberies, and if I had found a couple of deer grazing in the lawn or drinking from the birdbath, it wouldn't have surprised me. I got out of the beetle, holding my blasting rod loosely in my right hand. I opened the gate, and a few jingle bells hanging on the string tinkled happily. The gate swung shut on a lazy spring behind me. I knocked on the front door and waited but no one answered. I frowned. Michael's house had never been empty before. Charity had at least a couple of kids who weren't old enough to be in school yet, including the poor little guy they'd named after me, Harry Carpenter. How cruel is that? I frowned at the cloud-hazed sun. Weren't the older kids getting out of school shortly? Charity had some kind of maternal obsession with never allowing her kids to come home to an empty house. Someone should have been there. I got a sick, twisty feeling in the pit of my stomach. I knocked again, put my ear against the door, and listened. I could hear the slow tick of an old grandfather clock in the front room. The heater cycled on for a moment, and the vents inside whispered. There were a few sounds when a bit of breeze touched the house. The creaks of old and comfortable wood. Nothing else. I tried the front door. It was locked. I stepped back off the porch and followed the narrow driveway to the back of the property. In the front of the carpenter home would have qualified for better homes and gardens. The back would have been fit for craftsmen commercials. The large tree centered on the back lawn cast lots of shade in the summer, but with the leaves gone, 
I could see the forest-like tree Michael's tree-like house Michael had built for his kids in it. It had finished walls, an actual window, the guardrails, anywhere anyone could possibly have thought about falling. The treehouse had a porch that overlooked the yard. Hell, I didn't have a porch. It was an unfair world. A big section of the yard had been bitten off by an additional connected to the back of the house. The foundation had been laid, and there were wooden beams framing what would eventually be walls. Heavy contractor's plastic had been stapled to the wood studs to keep the wind off of the addition. The separate garage was closed, and a peek in the window showed me that it was pretty well filled with lumber and other construction materials. No cars, I muttered. And maybe they went to McDonald's or church. Do they have church at three in the afternoon? I turned around to go back to the beetle. I'd leave Michael a note. My stomach fluttered. If I didn't get a second for the duel, it was likely to be a bad evening. Maybe I should ask Bob to be my second. Or maybe Mr. No one dares mess with Mr. Something rattled against the metal gutters running the length to the back of the house. I jumped like a spooked horse and scrambled away from the house, toward the garage to the back of the yard, so that I could get a look at the roof. Given that, any the past day or so, no less than three different parties had taken a poke at me. I felt totally justified in being on edge. I got to the back of the yard, but couldn't see the whole roof from there, so I clambered up into the branches and then took a six-foot ladder up to the main platform of the treehouse. From there, I could see that the roof was empty. I heard brisk, somewhat heavy footsteps below me, and beyond the fence at the back of the little yard, I froze in place in the treehouse, listening. The heavy footsteps padded up to the fence at the back of the yard, and I heard the scrape of a chain link dragging against the dry leaves and another late winter, Deterius heard a muted grunt of effort and long exaltation. Then the footsteps came to the base of the tree. Leather scraped against a wooden step, and the tree shivered almost imperceptibly. Someone was climbing up. I looked around me, but the ladder was the only way down, unless I felt like jumping. It couldn't have been more than nine or ten feet down. Odds were, I could land more or less in one piece. But if I misjudged the jump, I could sprain an ankle or break a leg, which would make running away both impractical and embarrassing. Jumping would have to be a last resort. I gathered in my well and settled my grip on my blasting rod, pointing it directly at where the ladder met the platform. The tip of the blasting rod glowed with a pinpoint of bright red energy. Blonde hair and the top half of a girl's angelic young face appeared at the top of the ladder. There was a quiet gasp, and her blue eyes widened. Holy crap! I jerked the tip of the blasting rod up and away from the girl, releasing the gathered energy. Molly? The rest of the girl's face appeared as she climbed on up the ladder. Wow. Is that an acetylene torch or something? I blinked and peered more closely at Molly. Is that an earring in your eyebrow? The girl clapped her fingers over her right eyebrow. And your nose? Molly shot a furtive look over her shoulder at the house and scrambled the rest of the way up the treehouse. As tall as her mother, Molly was all cloddish legs and long arms. She wore a typical private school uniform, a skirt, blouse, and sweater. But it looked like she'd been attacked by a leech with razor blades where fingers should have been. The skirt was essentially slashed to ribbons. The underneath it, she wore black tights. Also, torn to nigh indecency 
her shirt and sweater had apparently endured the blitz. But the bright red stain bra had, that peeked out from beneath looked new. She had on too much makeup. Not as bad as most kids, too old to play tag, but too young to drive. But it was there. She wore a ring of fire gold wire through one pale gold eyebrow, and a golden stud protruded from one side of her nose. I worked hard not to smile. Smile would have implied that I found her outfit amusing. She was young enough to be hurt by that kind of opinion, and I had a vague memory of being that ridiculous at one time. Let he who hath never worn parachute pants cast the first stone. Molly clambered in and tossed a bulging backpack down on the wooden floor. You lurk in the tree houses a lot, Mr. Dresden? I'm looking for your dad. Molly wrinkled up her nose, then started removing the stud from it. I didn't want to watch. I don't want to tell you how to investigate stuff. But, generally speaking, you won't find him in treehouses. I came over, but no one answered the door when I knocked. Is that normal? Molly look, took out the eyebrow ring, dumped the backpack onto, out onto the floorboards, and started sorting out a long skirt with a floral print, a t-shirt, and a sweater. It, it is on Aaron's day. Mom loads up the sand crawler with a lot of snot-nosed jaws, and goes all over town. Oh, do you know when she's due back? Any time, Molly said. She hopped into the skirt and wriggled out of the tattered shirt and tights in that mystifying, modest way that girls always seem to manage to acquire sometime in their teens. The shirt and pink sweater went on next, and the ripped-up sweater and, to my discomfort, bright red bra came out from under the conservative clothes and got tucked back into the backpack. I turned my back on the girl as well as I could in the limited space. The link of handcuff Anna Valmont had slapped into my wrist, chafed and pinched. I scratched at it irritably. You'd think I'd been cuffed enough times that I should have gotten myself a key by now. Molly took a wet wipe from somewhere and started peeling the makeup from her face. Hey, she asked a minute later. What's wrong? I grunted and waved my wrist vaguely, swinging the cuff around. Hey, neat, Molly said. Are you on the lam? Is that why you're hiding in a treehouse? So the cops won't find you? No, I said. It's a kind of a long story. Oh, Molly said wisely. Those are fun time handcuffs. Not bad time handcuffs. I gotcha. No! I pro protested. And how the hell would you know about fun time handcuffs anyway? You're like ten. She snorted. Fourteen. Whatever. Too young. Internet, she said sagely, expanding the frontiers of adolescent knowledge. God, I'm old. Molly chuckled and dipped into the backpack again. She grabbed my wrist firmly, shook out a ring of small keys, and started trying them in the lock of the cuffs. So, give me the juicy details, she said. You can say bleep instead of the fun words if you want to. I blinked. Where the bleep did you get a bunch of cuff keys? She looked up at me and narrowed her eyes. Think about this. Do you really want to know? I sighed. No. Probably not. Cool, she said, and turned her attention back to the cuffs. So stop dodging the issue. What's up with you and Susan? What do you want to know? I like romance. Plus, I heard Mom say that you two were a pretty hot item. Your mom said that? Molly shrugged. Sorta. As much as she ever would. She used words like fornication and sin and infantile depravity, and moral bankruptcy. So, are you? Morally bankrupt? 
a hot item with Susan. I shrugged and said, not anymore. Don't move your wrist. Molly fiddled with one key for a moment before discharging it. What happened? A lot, I said. It's complicated. Oh, Molly said. The cuffs clicked and loosened, and she beamed up at me. There. Thanks. I rubbed my sore wrist and put the cuffs in my coat pocket. Molly bent over and picked up a piece of paper. She read it and said, Ask Michael about duel, whiskey, and tobacco. It's a shopping list. Molly frowned. Oh. She was quiet for a moment and then asked, So, was it the vampire thing? I blinked at the girl again. Was there a PBS special or something? Is there some kind of unauthorized biography on my life? I snuck downstairs so I could listen to Dad tell Mom what had happened. Do you eavesdrop on every private conversation you can? She rolled her eyes and sat down on the edge of the platform, her shoes waving in the air. No one says anything interesting in public conversation, do they? Why did you guys split up? I sat down next to her. Like I said, it was complicated. Complicated how? I shrugged. Her condition uh, gives her an impulse control problem, I said. She told me that strong emotions and uh, other feelings are dangerous for her. She could lose control and hurt someone. Oh, Molly said and scrunched up her nose again. So you can't make a play for her or bad things could happen. And then she'd be a full vampire. But you both want to be together, Molly asked. Yeah. She frowned. God, that's sad. You want to be with her, but the sex part... I shuddered. Ugh! You're far too young to say that word. The girl's eyes shone. What word? Sex? Sex? I put my hand over my ears. Gog! Molly grinned and enunciated. But the bleep part would make her lose control. I coughed uncomfortably, lowering my hands. Basically, yeah. Why didn't you tie her up then? I stared at the kid for a second. She lifted her eyebrows expectantly. What? I stammered. It's only practical, Molly stated firmly. And hey, you've already got the handcuffs. If she can't moo while the two of you are bleeping, she can't drink your blood, right? I stood up and started climbing down the ladder. Uh, this conversation has become way too bleeping disturbing for me. Molly laughed at me and followed me back to the ground. She unlocked the door with another key, presumably from the same ring. And then, oh, and that was when Charity's light blue minivan turned into the driveway. Molly opened the door, darted into the house, and returned without her backpack. The minivan ground to a halt, and the engine died. Charity got out of the van, frowning at me and at Molly in more of a less equal proportions. She wore jeans, hiking boots, and a heavy jacket. She was a tall woman, only an inch or so under six feet, and carried herself with an assurance that conveyed a sense of ready strength. Her face had the remote beauty of a marble statue and her long blonde hair was knotted behind her head. Without being told, Molly went into the rolling side panel, opened it, and reached inside, unloading children from safety seats, while Charity went to the rear of the van and opened the rear doors. Mr. Dresden, she said, lend a hand. I frowned. Uh, I'm sort of in a hurry. I was hoping to find Michael here. Charity took a 24-pack of Coke from the van in one arm and a couple of bulging paper grocery sacks in the other. She marched over to me and shoved them at my chest. I had to fumble to catch them, and my blasting rod clattered to the ground. Charity waited until I had the sacks before heading to the van again. Put them in on the kitchen table. But, I said, she waved past me toward the house. I have ice cream melting, meat thawing, and a baby about to wake up hungry. Put them on the table, and we'll talk. I sighed and looked glumly at the groceries. 
they were heavy enough to make my arms burn a little, which probably isn't saying much. I don't spend much time working out. Molly appeared from the van, lowering a tiny, toe-headed girl to the driveway. She was wearing a pink dress with a clashing orange sweater and bright purple shoes and a red coat. She walked up to me and said words edged with babyish syllables. My name is Amanda. I'm five and a half, and my daddy says I'm a princess. I'm Harry, your highness, I said. She frowned and said, There's already a Harry. You can be Bill. With that, she broke into a flouncing skip and followed her mother into the house. Well, I'm glad that's settled, I muttered. Molly lowered an even smaller blonde girl to the driveway. This one was dressed in blue overalls with a pink shirt and a pink coat. She held a plush dolly in one arm and battered-looking pink blanket in the other. Upon seeing me, she retreated a couple of steps and hid around the corner of the van. She leaned out to look at me once, and then hid again. I've got him, said an accented male voice. Molly hopped onto the van, grabbed a grocery bag from the back, and said, Come on, Hope. The little girl followed her big sister like a duckling while Molly went into the house. But Hope glanced back at me shyly three or four times on the way. Shiro emerged from the van carrying a baby seat. The little old knight carried the walking stick that concealed his sword on a strap over one shoulder. And his scarred hands held the chair carefully. A boy, probably not yet two, old, two years old, slept in it. Little Harry? I asked. Yes, Bill, Shiro said. His eyes sparkled behind his glasses. I frowned and said, Good-looking kid. Dresden! Snapped Charity's voice from the house. You're holding the ice cream. I scowled and told Shiro, I guess we'd better get in. Shiro nodded wisely. I took the groceries into Carpenter's big kitchen and put them on the table. For the next five minutes, Shiro and Molly helped me carry in enough groceries to feed a mongrel horde. After all the perishables got put away, Charity fixed a bottle of formula and passed it off to Molly, who took it, the diaper bag, and the sleeping boy into another room. Charity waited until she had left, then shut the door. Very well, she said, still putting groceries away. I haven't spoken to Michael since you called this morning. I left a message with his cell phone. Where is he, I asked. Shiro laid his cane onto the table and sat down. Mr. Dresden, we have asked you not to get involved in this business. That isn't why I'm here, I said. I just need to talk to him. Why are you looking for him? Shiro asked. I'm dueling a vampire under the accords. I need a second before sundown or I get disqualified. Permanently. Shiro frowned. Red court? Yeah, some guy named Ortega. Heard of him, Shiro said. Some kind of war leader. I nodded. That's the rumor. That's why I'm here. I had hoped Michael would be willing to help. Shiro stroked a thumb over the smooth old wood of his cane. We received word of Denarian activity near St. Louis. He and Sonia went to investigate. When will they get back? Shiro shook his head. I do not know. I looked at the clock and bit my lip. Christ. Charity walked by with an armload of groceries and glared at me. I lifted my hands. Sorry, I'm a little tense. Shiro studied me for a moment and then asked, Would Michael help him? Charity's voice drifted out of a cavernous walk-in pantry. My husband is sometimes an idiot. Shiro nodded and said, Then I will assist you in this stead, Mr. Dresden. Yo, what? I asked. I'll be your second in the duel. You don't have to do that, I said. I mean, I'll figure out something. Shiro lifted an eyebrow. Have the weapons been set for the duel? Uh, not yet, I said. Then where is the meeting with the emissary and your opponent's second? I flashed out the card I'd gotten from the archive. I don't know. I was told to have my second call this number. 
Shiro took the card and rose without another word, heading for the phone in the next room. I put my hand on his arm and said, You don't need to take any chances. You don't really know me. Michael does. That is enough for me. The old knight's support was a relief, but I felt guilty, somehow for accepting it. Too many people had been hurt on my behalf in the past. Michael and I had faced trouble together before, looked out for each other before. Somehow, it made it easier for me to go to him to ask for help. Accepting the same thing from a stranger, knight of the cross or not, grated on my conscience, or maybe on my pride. But what choice did I have? I sighed and nodded. I just don't want to drag someone else into this trouble with me. Charity muttered, Let me think. Where have I heard that before? Shiro smiled at her, the expression both paternal and amused, and said, I'll make the call. I waited while Shiro made a call for the room, or from the room that served as a family study and the office for Michael's contracting business. Charity stayed in the kitchen and wrestled a huge crockpot onto the counter. She got out a ton of vegetables, stew meat, and a spice rack and set to chopping things up without a word to me. I watched her quietly. She moved with the kind of precision you only see in someone who is so vested at what they are doing that they are already thinking of steps coming 20 minutes in the future. I thought she took her knife to the carrots a little more violently than she needed to. She started preparing another meal somewhere in the middle of making the stew. This one, chicken and rice, and other healthy things I rarely saw in three dimensions. I fidgeted for a bit until I stood up, washed my hands in the sink, and started cutting vegetables. Charity frowned at me for a moment. She didn't say anything. But she got a few more veggies out and put them down next to me, then collected what had been cut so far and pitched them into the crock pot. A couple of minutes later, she sighed, opened a can of Coke, and put it on the counter next to me. I worry about him, she said. I nodded and focused on cucumbers. I don't even know when he'll come home tonight. Good thing you have a crock pot, I said. I don't know what I would do without him. What the children would do. I'd feel so lost. What the hell? An ounce of well-intentioned but irrational reassurance didn't cost anything. I took a sip of the Coke. He'll be all right. He can handle himself. And he has Sonia with him. He's been hurt three times, you know. Three? I asked. Three. With you. Every time. So it's my fault. My turn to chop the vegetables like teenagers in slasher movies. I see. I couldn't see her face, but her voice was more... Ah, uh, they stuck together. I couldn't see her face, but her voice was more than anything else tired. It isn't about blame, or whose fault it is. All that matters is that when you're around, my husband, my children's father gets hurt. The knife slipped, and I cut off a neat little slice of skin on my index finger. Owl! I snarled. I slapped the cold water on the sink and put my finger under it. You can't tell with cuts like that how bad they're going to be until you see how much you're leaking. Charity passed me a paper towel, and I examined the cut for a minute before wrapping the towel around it. It wasn't bad, though it hurt like hell. I watched my blood stain the paper towel for a minute, and then I asked, Why didn't you get rid of me then? I looked up to see Charity frowning at me. There were dark circles under her eyes that I hadn't noticed before. What do you mean? Just now, I said, when Shiro asked if Michael would help me. You could have said no. But he would have helped you in an instant. You know that. Shiro didn't. Her expression became confused. I don't understand. You could have lied. Her face registered comprehension, and some fire came back into her eyes. I don't like you, Mr. Dresden. 
I certainly don't care for you enough to abandon beliefs I hold dear, to use you as an excuse to cheapen myself or to betray what my husband stands for. She stepped to the cabinet and got out a small, neat medical kit. Without another word, she took my hand and the paper towel and opened the kit. So, you're taking care of me? I asked. I don't expect you to understand. Whether or not I can personally stand you, it has no bearing on what choices I make. Michael is your friend. He would risk his life for you. It would break his heart if you came to grief, and I will not allow that to happen. She fell silent and doctored the cut with the same brisk, confident motions she used for cooking. I hear that they make disinfectants that don't hurt these days. But Charity used iodine. Thank you for listening to chapter 15 Ow. of the Dresden Files. Stay tuned for chapter 16 of book 5. Do give me, you know, likes, thumbs up. Well, if you do give me a thumbs down, leave a comment. Tell me why. Um, tell me what I can do to make things better, you know, increase the channel. Um, tell me what books I can read in the future or what other things you'd like. Um, we're not quite halfway done with this uh, series yet. But um, hopefully that'll come up kind of uh, kind of decently quickly. Um, anyway, thank you very much for watching my YouTube channel. And you have a blessed and wonderful day.